Oh, welcome to another episode of Monday Morning Murph. Matthew Collar here, along with Brian Murphy, who uh, wrote a very nice column about the only subject one could write about yesterday, which was, hey, Harrison Smith, still really good at football. And other than that, Murph, when I think about my time covering the Vikings when I'm 78 years old and I'm retired on a Minnesota Lake. And I think I remember the good old days. I remember the Minneapolis miracle. I remember the comeback game in Buffalo. You know what game's not going to come to mind? The Vikings beating the Carolina Panthers 21 to 13. Uh, I thought you took the right angle writing about Harrison Smith. That was good to see. That's why Brian Flores is here, but other takeaways are pretty tough to come by when it comes to that game. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it was certainly not entertaining. It was enough to make your eyes bleed at times. Uh, it was frustrating. It was boring. It was uh, just not really good schematic or entertaining football for various times. But then you forgot how good Harrison Smith is, maybe. And you forgot that this was, this is a guy that is probably building a Hall of Fame res- resume more brick by brick than, you know, big flashy plays all at once. But he had a flashy day yesterday, and he had a flashy day that not only counted, uh, but at least for the time being, really tightens the tourniquet for the Vikings. I mean, obviously, we know who's coming in town next week. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and maybe some pop singer that you may have heard of as well that'll be invading for the 330 national game next week. This very well could be one in four. But at the very least, you buy at least another week of time. You sort of you know, validate two things. One, bringing in Brian Flores uh, to, to really die up the, dial up the aggressive, uh, put a rookie quarterback in his place type schemes that, that really, really did flourish yesterday. And also put, a, put an old guy, old playmaker in a position to make big time plays at big time moments. And it was nice to see Harrison Smith come through like that, but it was also nice to see how the team sort of, at least in its comments, and certainly on the defensive side, certainly head coach Kevin O'Connell, really rally around Smith and sort of build him up as, look, this is a guy that is sort of the glue in a lot of ways to this defense. And let's let's not forget that, you know, he took a pay cut almost in half just to come back here as opposed to retiring because Brian Flores and his aggressive schemes maybe – kind of convinced him, hey, you know, maybe the best days of my career under Mike Zimmer can be resurrected here a little bit. And boy, did he come up with the right plays at the right time. And he and he allowed, you know, sort of his the rest of his defensive teammates to flourish at times because of the work that he was doing as well. So it was a it was sort of an opportunity to look at what this defense might be. But let's not kid ourselves. They're not going to be able to fool Patrick Mahomes the way they were able to fool uh, Bryce Young yesterday. Yeah, that's completely true, and uh, it's uh, he's also one of the hardest quarterbacks to beat on the blitz, although, I mean, we'll talk about it throughout the week. Everything has looked a little more human, that he's still winning, and the Chiefs are still a great football team, but without a, a top receiver, and even last year, it looks like he doesn't really even have a competent receiver like Juju Smith-Schuster. It's kind of a bunch of young guys, and then Travis Kelsey, and their offensive line is not very good, and this is where Marcus Davenport's health is going to be really important. So if we talk about the big takeaways, Harrison Smith, of course, I agree with you that I mean, he just continues to be Harrison Smith as long as you let him. And uh, gosh, I feel like Ed Donatel stole something from Harrison Smith last year. And he still had a bunch of interceptions last season because he just is a natural playmaker. And and so he, he didn't have like a horrendous last season, even in, in the completely wrong usage. But that was one of the reasons that I was believing in Brian Flores was that he was using Harrison Smith throughout training camp in the right ways and putting him in position to drive the offense nuts and to surprise opposing quarterbacks. And also in training camp, Marcus Davenport looked really darn good, Murph. I mean, this guy is huge and he's fast. And when it, you go the drop off from Davenport to DJ Wanham or Patrick Jones starting, I mean, we, we see those guys could be a little bit of a rotational player, but but in a starting role is really big. And we saw that yesterday as well. So as we're going forward here, I think you see 
two things. I mean, one, Brian Flores was no fool. He wasn't just sending all those blitzes at Justin Herbert because he lost his mind. It was probably the only thing he thought gave them a chance. And then you see what happens when the opposing offense can't handle it as well as Justin Herbert, but also what Kevin O'Connell has been saying about Marcus Davenport, which is every time he talks about the defense, we need this guy back. We need this guy back. He's completely right. He's completely right. And I think we saw it yesterday. Yeah, he was disruptive. He was a factor. And I think he made everybody else around him better. But let's let's be honest. I mean, he just hasn't been available that much the last couple of seasons, both in New Orleans and then here as well. So, you know, if he's back and he's healthy and he's fresh and he's able to free up and, and you know, maybe he makes Daniil Hunter better around him. Maybe he frees up Smith to be a little bit more creative on the backside and doing what he does, which is showing a lot of different looks uh, sneaking down to the line, uh, you know, playing more more of a chess match, a high level chess match with quarterbacks and opposing offensive coordinators than just the brute force uh, of being the hitman. Um, he may have, you may have to consider changing him from the hitman to maybe the checkmate man, just because he is so smart and he has so much experience now with what he can do. That I think his his greatest asset is almost as a co-defensive coordinator now out on that field than it is actually a physical playmaker. Although again, what we saw yesterday is he can certainly uh, dial up big plays and big moments when he can, but let's, again, that's this for once the defense was able to cover up for a multitude of sins on offense, because I don't think there's too many opponents yesterday. uh, The Vikings would have been able to beat with the way their offense was not only not productive, but you know, cousins making, some key mistakes and key moments, the pick six, obviously the offensive line suspect as usual, you know, Ed, Ed Ingram gets ventilated on that uh, one hit where, you know, cousins essentially put the ball up for free and put it up for grabs. You had a lot of momentum swings in that game that could have gone badly. I mean, the, but for a penalty on the Panthers, I mean, I think they got inside the 10 yard line uh, on that drive before, you know, Smith forced the fumble and, that was a 14 point swing. I mean, the, I, I was essentially dreading the fact that this was now going to be an O and four team that we were going to have to gin up a lot of juicy and fun content over the next 13 weeks to justify our existence. And I'm not sure collar, we would have been able to do that. So all of a sudden you buy a little bit of time. It takes a huge amount of edge off, you know, O and four is, is, is a black hole. One in three is you're, you're basically hanging on by your fingernails But it does give you some kind of hope. And, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, the Chiefs are, I hate to say the Chiefs are vulnerable. That's a strong word to say for the Super Bowl champs who happen to be three and one and, you know, walked into New York and and found a way to basically snuff the life out of the Jets with that long drive benefit of a suspect defensive holding call on third and 20, no doubt. But this is a Chiefs team that, as you mentioned, you know, they, they, their, their offensive line has got some question marks. The downfield threats aren't as much there. Mahomes can still improvise with the best of them. But to come home and have a chance to play, I wouldn't give them any chance in Arrowhead, but to get to be at home, uh, you know, they're 0-2 at home. The Vikings need to redeem themselves at home, and and maybe this is the uh, – the opponent, the opportunity they're looking for. Folks, we are going all in on prize picks this football season. Every week we are playing and testing out our skills here on Purple Insider to see if we could predict what numbers players will put up every Sunday. If you haven't heard of it, trust me, you're going to want to check it out. Prize picks is the easiest and best way to play daily fantasy. Instead of battling against thousands of other players and people who spend their entire lives doing fantasy, all you do is pick more or less on between two and six player stat projections. So say a quarterback's number is 250.5 yards, go more or less and bang, you are playing and you can pick from hundreds of players and numbers this football season. The cool thing is that it's quick and easy and does not cost an arm and a leg. You can turn $10 into 250 just like that. Again, the perfect way to fit it into a busy day. 
click, click, and you're playing. This isn't just something that I like. You're going to hear us doing every single week prize picks on the show on Purple Insider. So go to prizepicks.com slash purple and use the code purple for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash purple with the code purple. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Yeah, just and and totally agree that if you're going to have a chance having it at U.S. Bank Stadium coming off a game where it looked like they struggled on the offensive line uh, to pick up a lot of the Jets' pressures, it may, you know, you can start to like talk yourself into, hey, this is a Vikings team that upset Buffalo last year. Like maybe you could pull something off. But let's circle back, though, to uh, some other parts of that game that you brought up. I mean, number one is you are totally right that – uh, to the victor goes the narrative that, you know, Brian Flores' defense is back, baby, and they got everything right. But, uh, you know, it's a game of uh, one drive here or there where Harrison Smith strips sack. If Bryce Young understands how to identify anything at the line of scrimmage, he throws that ball away or he just tucks it and takes a sack. And there's still, I think, in field goal position, even if he takes a sack there or maybe one completion away, their kicker has a big leg, I guess, as everyone does when they play the Minnesota Vikings. But, I mean, get, they were this close to going up 16-7. to seven. And if they go up 16 to seven, things get very dicey there uh, because they were able to pressure Kirk when he did drop back. The Vikings offense was barely on the field uh, during the game because of the couple of turnovers that they had, which are looking more like this is a thing the Vikings do as opposed to just completely, totally random events. And I also think that it's sort of like We've talked about many times during the Kirk era, this game of whack-a-mole where you think you've solved something and then something else pops up and it's like, oh, that's right. Kirk Cousins is capable of having a bad game as every quarterback in the NFL is, but you can't afford any the rest of the way because he had good games and you lost. And, and so, yeah, they survived this bad game from Kirk Cousins, but would they survive it? Even if he had one in Denver later this year, would they survive it? Like their offense can move the football a little bit. I mean, I'm getting too far down the road, but like if you play poorly against San Francisco in a couple of weeks, you'll definitely lose that game and you won't give your team a chance. And the same goes for this week, where if that wasn't just a one week blip in Carolina, because his body didn't adjust to Eastern time, which also happens to me every time I go out there, it's like messes with me for a couple of days. Then, you know, but if that happens against Kansas city, it's over. If it happens in Chicago, it's over. It's like the, they need to upset either Kansas city or San Francisco and then win every game that they need to win the rest of the way. And that game served as a little bit of a reminder. Oh, you can have one of those days. And that's why it's going to be so hard. I think. Yeah, and I don't think they're they're delusional to thinking that this this game was the ultimate stopgap. This was the game that's going to pivot. This is the game that, you know, can turn around a season. No, it was a necessary victory at a desperate time against an inferior opponent. Essentially, you did your job. <laughs> the Vikings did their job and won. Uh, this week coming up, and as you mentioned, in two weeks when San Francisco visits here on a Monday night, uh, it's not only going to – maybe define where the Vikings stand in the season, but it's also going to just validate whether they're relevant for the rest of the way. So you're right. The margin for error is gone, but I don't get the sense that they are uh, puffing their chests out too much after yesterday. I think they realized, you know, as you mentioned, the turnover issue now, it really feels baked in. I, I don't, you're almost going into this thinking they're going to have two ghastly turnovers, whether it's fumble or an interception, and they're going to have to overcome that. That's almost like part of the game plan now until proven otherwise. We're four games in and they are sloppy. And the timing of these turnovers that they're committing are are awful as well. I mean, the pick six there on the first drive of the game, I mean, that 99-yard return, that's the kind of play that if you make against Kansas City or San Francisco, you may never get that opportunity again. You're not probably coming near the goal line again. And also from an emotional and psychological standpoint, those kinds of uh, gaffes are, are are daggers usually. So, but against Carolina, no, not necessarily because again, you got a rookie quarterback, you got a rebuilding team, and you have they're almost as directionless as they have been for the past several years. So that is more of a you caught an inferior opponent at the right time for your schedule. It's not going to get easier. 
One thing I would I would look at though I, I the Davenport return and his impact. Um, you know, we have we may get into this a little bit. You know, Cam Akers. You know, he came in and and now it's suddenly the rushing attack doesn't look so feeble. Um, you know, Madison had some moments. Akers certainly had some moments yesterday, and they are able to actually establish something. That's one thing that was an improvement that we hadn't seen hopes of. The interior offensive line still 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 suspect. Um, I don't know when we're going to get Reisner in there. I don't know what he's in town for, but you know, at any moment now, we should be expecting him. I don't think he necessarily needs to master the playbook as much as he just needs to be a bodyguard for Kirk right now. So when is he going to get integrated into the lineup? Um, I, I want to see where I want to see how they respond at home to this challenge, but the first half, the first quarter, the first drive are probably going to be more important and more pronounced in terms of what they can show on either side of the ball, because Kansas city can take over a game very, very quickly and kind of steal your soul and steal the home field advantage right away. So I don't think, you know, the Vikings as sloppy as they've been are not going to be able to get away with huge unforced errors early uh, without paying more of a penalty than they did yesterday. Our only theories there on the riser thing would just be that it's really hard to show up and be ready to play 70 snaps. Although not that the Vikings ever get 70 offensive plays, it seems, but to play a whole bevy of snaps when it's hot out, like it's the, the conditioning element of it throughout training camp is kind of a big deal. There's also maybe the possibility that it didn't look as good in practice as they wanted it to look. I, I mean, I don't know when you're kind of tossing out ideas, but I think it is hard to learn an entire NFL playbook in a couple of weeks uh, for somebody. But if he's not playing against Kansas City, then we are going to look around and be like, oh, what? What is he here for? Um, and 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 look, if they were a fine offensive line getting depth, I, we wouldn't have this discussion, but it's the same player getting beat over and over and over, and everybody knows it. I promise the Kansas City Chiefs have noticed who it is. Even if they were just throwing him in there on third and long or something, like a rotational guard, anybody in for this? A third and long. There can't be that many things in the playbook for third and long. Can we just show him those plays and have him block you know, somebody up because he is a much better pass blocking guard. We'll see uh, if that happens. The, the one case uh, that won't happen, but we'll see if he plays. They, I don't think rotational guard is going to happen. But uh, the one interesting case about this Vikings team, if you're trying to make the argument that they can do it, which I, you know, Kevin O'Connell, that's his job now is pretty much to keep coming up there and making the argument to the team. We can do it. We can do it. One of the things he does have in his pocket is that they are a better football team going in to face Kansas City today than they were week one. Um, if, if they get Bradbury back, that's even better. Although I haven't been displeased with the way that Austin Schlotman has played. I think he's actually been pretty good. I mean, they've run the ball the last two weeks. I, I, no one's good when you're facing Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis, right? But the last couple of weeks when he's had time to prepare and hasn't played some of the best defensive tackles in football, I think he's been okay. But if they get the whole offensive line that they want it to be, Akers in the mix, who I thought was very impressive, and you could see why he was a high draft pick once upon a time, and then Davenport healthy, that's – that's an unusually healthy team for one, like into the season like this, but it's also a much better team than they played the first week against, which is kind of rare. Like you don't see that very often. So if you're making the case, that's probably one of the best things you have in your back pocket there. Yeah. And you also mentioned too, that, you know, Kevin O'Connell, that's his sales pitch now going forward. And what, you know, so much of what being a winless coach is, is damage control and preventing it's a psychological game where you're trying to prevent your team from slipping into a here we go again mentality or you know a chicago bears mentality where their body language just speaks volumes on the sideline you know this is almost a defeated team before they they line up for the the coin toss so o'connell right now has an opportunity to sell the belief he has an opportunity to to say, look, our defense finally came up and did something. He's not going to frame it that way, but that's exactly what happened. The defense finally came up and did something because not only were they a disaster all of last season, they were a disaster against the Giants in the playoffs, 
And they were as much of a reason for why the Vikings were 0 3 as, as the turnovers were. So you have some confidence now in your unit. You can, you actually can say to your offense, you know, don't feel like you have to make the perfect play at every moment. We have some playmakers here on defense. Don't forget. Um, they actually bailed, bailed you out fine this time. Now, again, we're talking opponent to opponent. Carolina is not Kansas city. Kansas city is the best team until somebody knocks them off. They are the, with the most valuable player in the pocket who can beat you in so many different ways, so many different creative ways, ways you're not used to seeing. So it's, it's fine to sell that. Uh, what I think though, is I think you need to sell belief. And I think right now O'Connell's in a position where he knows he's coming up against, you know, Andy Reid, one of the greatest coaches in the history of the NFL. He knows he's coming up against the most valuable player and a two-time Super Bowl champion. So this is the time to make your mark as a coach, not only in preparation, but in selling your squad the belief that you can be the greatest team in the world for three hours on Sunday. I'd like to see how they respond to that. Again, everything with O'Connell is like a new experience. They're 0 3. He's plugging the dike. He's trying to, you know, manage a crisis, several crises. He he bought it. He bought some time. How do they respond to that? What's his message going to be this week? How does the team respond to that? I think they're going to be. I think they're going to be fired up. I think you're going to see them be a little bit more. Um, I don't want to say cautious, but at least aware of their surroundings, perhaps than they were in week one and week three at home, where it almost felt like they were relying on that that home field advantage and the fact that, you know what, we can, we can step up when we need to at home because we have in the past, it didn't work. Tampa just kind of milked the clock on them. And then obviously Justin Herbert torched them all over the field and and beat every blitz that Flores could dial up. So now you're back home again against Kansas city. You've got a little bit of confidence because of what you did down in Carolina. How are you going to play with that house money a little bit? Uh, Because this is, you know, this could be the game of the season right now, psychologically, schematically, and then practically in terms of, you know, one in four is is an awfully large hole to climb out of uh, two and three against the defending champions getting a victory. I mean, you can really reset your season. All right. Two important questions. Number one, I got the tweet yesterday. Imagine some people were thinking it that when Bryce Young was driving, trying to tie the game, that. They Vikings fans weren't necessarily rooting against him to do so that, uh, you know, maybe rooting to put a nail in this thing. And also, again, I say this every week, but if you watch Saturday football, there are some candidates for the uh, future quarterback. And after being uninspired by the Vikings quarterback yesterday and being reminded that those uh, roller coaster uh, from week to week moments happen with him. Would it have been better if they lost Murph in some universe? And I know this, uh, this is a, a, a thing that, that you've never really been for teams like not, you know, tanking and so forth, but they weren't tanking. They were just not playing good and they were all allowing Carolina to stay in that game. So like, would it have been better in the bigger picture if they had just lost and sort of put a nail in this thing and we don't have to play the, in the hunt game as we go along, or would you prefer that the season stay alive and they have a chance? These are two great philosophical questions. Look, I, I get the practical implications of them going 0-4 and, and turning their sights to the 2024 draft and reimagining uh, what the roster can look like with assets, uh, reimagining what the quarterback position is going to look like. Because at 0-4, you're a lame, you know, with a lame duck quarterback, there's going to be a lot of chatter up until the trade deadline about what are you going to do about Cousins? What are you going to do going forward if you're just kind of lurching around here winless? I understand all of that. I understand the excitement that, you know, playing fantasy football and being a general manager 24-7, 365. I understand the, you know, when you're when you're contemplating and plotting for the the unknown and the possibility it's so much more exciting than trying to deal with the the reality at hand. I've never been one to buy into that only because from a writer standpoint, from an, a fan who wants to be entertained standpoint, 
you want to see the Vikings be relevant. You want to see them playing relevant games. You want to see them going up against the best and trying to defeat them and not thinking about, I, are we going to win April? Are we going to win May? Are we going to win in June? That's all fine and dandy, but for me, no, I don't want that. I wanted to, I want to see them, you know, we, you, but you know, Oh, and four was a death knell. One and four isn't much better. Two and five, three and six. I mean, we could be lurching throughout the season, but as long as they're in the hunt, as long as there are relevant games to be played against quality opponents, that's what I want to tune in for. I don't want to tune in for the speculation game of uh, if this drive is completed by the opponent, then now we can turn our sights on who's available in the draft and start playing the chess match of, you know, the 53 man roster intrigue. That's just something that's never interested me as a former journalist or as a entertainment consumer right now. I want to watch relevant teams play relevant games and produce big moments. I don't want to necessarily speculate on what the roster could look like going into training camp next year. That's just me. I'm an old school guy. Just entertain me with what is in front of me on the television screen or on the field, not what may happen in the draft room. Guys, I know you might act tough and pretend that you don't care about how the skin on your face looks, but we all want to show up to those football parties and holiday get togethers looking good. That's where Caldera Lab comes in. Over 100,000 men trust Caldera Lab because of the way that an easy skincare routine turns into clearer skin. They get results. And hey, it makes a great gift as well. You're going to want to try out the regimen, which has three simple parts, the clean Clean Slate, which is a face wash that leaves you feeling refreshed, the base layer that moisturizes and hydrates your skin, and the good. This helps your skin look tighter and smoother, and dare I say, even a little bit younger with the reduction of wrinkles and fine lines. If you've looked in the mirror and thought, when did I start looking like this? Well, the trials have shown that 94% of men showed improvement in their appearance using Caldera Lab for just a few weeks. So just for you guys, use the code insider at calderalab.com and get 20% off right now. That is 20% off at calderalab.com with the code insider to make an unforgettable first impression and give the best gift this holiday season. Folks want to remind you to make Little Caesars the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. Order online during their pizza pizza pregame one hour before NFL games and get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or their in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the tastiest hour before kickoff. And I think that that is totally fair. And the way that I have been thinking about it is that CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson and Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen and many others, Lamar Jackson, were not the first quarterbacks taken. And I, I think Caleb Williams, after watching him the other day, is spectacularly talented, but it's not he's not the only fish in the sea. So we kind of have to just wait and see how that plays out. But like there will be quarterbacks to draft this year. This isn't a situation like last year where had they been in this spot last year, if all those close games went the wrong way, I'd be saying you, you might need to because the quarterbacks are going to go in the top five. Well, there's so many of them this year who could be first round picks and not every team uh, is going to need a quarterback. So, you know, and plus last year they had had no draft capital to trade up. This year they will, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you're not with every win losing out on Andrew Luck as the Vikings once did by winning a game against Washington late in the season. And only God knows where we'd be as a franchise uh, if th that had happened, probably in a better place than they were in Indianapolis. And they were pretty darn good in Indianapolis when they had him. But I don't think it's like that. I don't think you were ever going to be this close to Caleb Williams because later in the season, they were going to win games anyway. The only way would have been, and that leads into the other part that I want to ask you about, is if they had traded Cousins, then yes, you are going to lose a lot of football games if you trade Cousins. 
I think that's a impossible thing to do to Harrison Smith, to Justin Jefferson, to Christian Derrissaw, to the great players on this team. It's very, very difficult to say we're bailing on all of you guys. I know we've got all these talented players, but you know, we'll see you next year, guys. I mean, I, I don't think you can do that. So I've never bought that they were going to do something like that, but the next three weeks are really going to determine this because if they lose to Kansas city and then go to Chicago and lay an egg there, which would not be the first time, then, then it's a different discussion. I mean, then we're halfway through the season and you're nowhere close, but you pull an upset, you get a win in Chicago. The season is still alive in some ways. And I don't see any other way to go about it than just say, Hey, if they have a magical playoff run, they're probably still going to be able to get or run to the playoffs. Uh, I hear people say playoff run when a team makes the playoffs. I don't like you got to like do something in the playoffs. N not the point. Uh, but I, I think if, if they start to have this emergence where they start reeling off wins, I don't think you should sit there and be mad because they're moving down the draft board. Uh, you, you're you just going to have to let that play out, right? I mean, we, we saw Kansas City and Buffalo move up to get their quarterbacks. I know it hasn't worked out with Fields, but Chicago moved up to get Justin Fields. Like, it's not impossible to draft a quarterback if your team has, you know, a magical comeback to the season. So I guess to me, I've just thought ride the roller coaster. Uh, but if they lose the next two weeks, I'm going to change my tone and say there's no reason to keep your quarterback around if there's anybody who wants him. Right, because now you're looking at one of five where you know the season's over, and it's not even a sell job to the locker room necessarily. I mean, as much as everybody loves Harrison Smith and wants to see him um, end his career on, a, on at least a competitive note and not on a tanking note, um, the sentimentality goes out the window if you're one in five. And the other, you know, you have to consider what the marketplace is going to be like. I, what is it, November 1st or October 31st? I mean, we're talking another month. So... If the Vikings are in a, in a no-win situation where they're not even getting wins and another team is des desperate enough to overpay for a veteran quarterback, I mean, that's catching lightning in a bottle too. And you'd be it'd be malfeasance if you're part of the front office that you don't consider uh, trading to get, you know, maybe fleecing a, a desperate team for some assets. Uh, one person, though, that you do need to sell this hard to is Justin Jefferson because you didn't get the contract extension done. You're basically telling him, we're going to see how this plays out this season. And he's seeing dollar signs in his eyes because of the way he's producing, but also because he, in a way, did get snubbed while the Vikings were handing out money everywhere else, it seemed like. Uh, and, you're, not, you know, he's not sure who's going to be the guy throwing to him for the next five years. If it's not Cousins, um, I would think he would be the one you would need to placate more so than than Darisar or Harrison Smith or even the fan base. I think you need to be on the same page with Justin Jefferson if if it looks like this is going to, if not in tank mode, you're playing for pride mode. And maybe there's a little bit of a subtle difference there. Uh, you know, you're not playing to lose, but you know you're not going to be able to win enough with the existing roster to actually go to the playoffs. How do you frame that discussion with Justin Jefferson if you end up shipping Kirk Cousins off to wherever in on November 1st? What's that first conversation with Jefferson going to be like? He's the one you got to placate. He's the one you got to pay attention to because all he's doing is putting up insane numbers despite everybody having a laser beam of attention on him. And you didn't extend him during this during the preseason. It's almost you know, you, you've got options as a team. You can franchise tag him, and there's all kinds of things that are unplayer friendly that you can do to retain his rights. But the biggest thing you need to do is make sure he's on board with whatever plan you have going forward, if that plan includes a two and six record without Kirk Cousins. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that yesterday, Murph. How many wins would the Vikings have over the last two years without Justin Jefferson? The answer is not that many. And I know that mathematically, the wins above replacement uh, that football has is not something that's like easy to find. Like PFF created this metric, but it's kind of in-house, like they don't share it all the time. And so you can't just like look it up. But uh, we got a hold of that data in the offseason and did a study on how valuable Kurt, or, uh, Justin Jefferson was. 
it's about as valuable as an average quarterback, which is insane. Like that's, he's about the most valuable non quarterback player in the entire league. And dang, did you see that yesterday? I mean, it was just remarkable. It's like the, the game is on ice. It's a struggle. It's everything's looking bad. And then Justin Jefferson just goes, now nah, I'm good. I'll just make a ridiculous catch, look super easy, and then laugh at the cornerback who's uh, trying to cover me. It was like, okay. And that's been so many games where you should be out of it. It should be over. And then they just have a Jefferson drive where he does everything. And I, I whatever he, whatever his side wanted in, in uh, training camp is not enough. He's probably worth more than that. So a mistake I think we might go back to consistently is saying all you did was wait till his price went up because he just did it again and again and again. But I totally agree with you. If there was something like that on the table, if they were to lose to Kansas City and then Atlanta comes calling or someone gets a quarterback hurt and says, hey, what if Brock Purdy were to get hurt in San Francisco and they say, trade us Kirk Cousins? I mean, you have to go to Justin Jefferson and say, we've got this offer. What do you think? Is this going to change your outlook? And if he said, don't trade Kirk, then you, all right, okay, we're good. We're not trading Kirk. I, I think that he's that important to their future that you can't just throw away the rest of the season um, unless he's going to sign off on that move for what it means for the future. He's a big college football fan. So I don't know, maybe he understands what's going on there. Uh, anyway, Murph, what do you think now after watching this uncompelling 21 to 13 victory about their chances to get back into the playoff race, knowing, knowing other information, knowing that Kansas city had some struggles, knowing that Jordan love maybe is not the next Aaron Rodgers, shockingly. Uh, and uh, the Chicago bears can lose a game even when they play really well. So now with new info, what do you think? I think they've got a shot to upset the chiefs. Um, I, because I think Kansas City is scuffling a little bit more uh, than we're used to seeing, I think this victory is going to, you know, energize the Vikings and the coaching staff as it should. And I think you're going to see a fantastic atmosphere Sunday afternoon. Obviously, it's the later game. It's the national game. You know, maybe Taylor Swift makes an appearance. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to think that that should generate, you know, should determine whether or not somebody tunes in to a game, but if you're in the building, I think there's going to be an atmosphere there that's going to probably rival most, you know, a playoff game. So that being said, I, I think they, they can rise to that occasion and they've shown enough in pockets this season where you wouldn't be shocked if they upset the chiefs, but it's going to come down, you know, they got to play a perfect game. Almost. They have yet to do that and they got to rise to the occasion. And the last time we wanted them to rise to the occasion at home against the New York Giants, uh, they fell flat. So I, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that they're going to play a competitive game. I think it's going to be a really entertaining game. Um, it would make their season with a victory because it recal recalculates and recalibrates everything. A loss is almost sort of expected, but then you run out of your, your wiggle room. So I, yeah, this is why we tune in. That's why we say it week to week. Build up the narrative, tear it down when it's over. But there is a lot at stake for not just the 2023 Vikings, but the 2024 and beyond Vikings. And I think if they're going to revive their season, it's going to have to include an upset victory either over Kansas City and San Francisco, or at least one of them, while taking care of Chicago in between. But, uh, you know, it could set a really important tone if they show up. Sunday and and take down the defending champs. Yeah, the way I would put it, Murph, is the Kevin O'Connell era Vikings. There's no team they can't beat and no team they can't lose to <laughs> on a week to week basis is the way that I would put it. And they almost lost to Carolina, which is uh, not a good argument for beating Kansas City this week. And yet still, I have it in the back of my mind. Maybe. Uh, I could see it because if, if they have one great game offensively, uh, well, guess what? You'll be writing uh, after that game, reacting to it as well as podcasting. So I will look forward to that Murph and we will see where this thing goes because uh, one upset and you are right. This is a completely different season and the feeling that we're going to have if they beat Kansas city. And if they don't, we'll say that's what we thought was going to happen. So I will talk to you next Monday then. Thanks Murph.